we've just been watching budgies all morning and it keeps getting bigger. There are, I don't even know how to quantify how many budgies there are. Even when we were, knew we were coming to see budgies, there's no way I could have imagined that this was what was going to happen. It's kind of like when you imagine how they um, represent a swarm of bees in cartoons and they make the cartoon bees create these shapes. The budgies are doing exactly that. I've never seen a group of animals make so many shapes. We were wondering when we first arrived uh, if anything was going to happen and then you started hearing them in the bushes and then little by little little groups started coming across the landscape and it just kept growing and now it's this. When you first get here in the morning you see you know groups of five or ten little budgies come in but as the sun comes up they all come together in these big flocks and it just gets bigger and bigger. You've got budgies coming in from all across the landscape and joining this big flock and then they branch off again. Look at this. We've just got another flock coming in from the north to join them. And they all kind of come down like a tornado and get together at the water and drink. It's so different seeing the budgies in the wild like this. I had a pet one when I was little and it was, it was just one bird. But when you've got thousands like this, it's just, they take on a different meaning altogether. I'd just love to know how the landscape, because the landscape, you know, it's not like other parts of the country. It's pretty spare. So how does it support such life like this? Yeah, I've been wondering about the budgies and what this type of behaviour contributes to the landscape. Like, I imagine they must be playing a really important function to keep all of this in balance. Um, and I wonder what that is. To tell the story of what's happening here, it's very much the story of the Australian climate uh, and particularly the desert climates. The Australian uh, deserts are famous for having one of the worst kind of patterns of uh, boom and bust in the world. The rainfall cycles here operate on a much grander scale. There can be very wet years and then nothing for 20 years, very, very hard droughts in between. So even though the average rainfall might sort of make it look like it's a kind of, you know, a, a semi-desert, uh, in between those really big rain events, it is a hard desert and it's a hard place to live. The wildlife in Australia has had to adapt to that situation. One of the big ways of dealing with it is nomadism, where birds, rather than being fixed to one place and doing things on a constant annual cycle, instead they try and live to be in tune with that much longer cycle, the 20 year rain cycle, where they capitalize on the giant booms and that's what these birds are doing. There's been a big rain here, uh, a lot of latent energy, uh, a lot of fertility in the soil that has gone unused for years because there's been no water. That rain hit us over the summer, this fertility is unleashed, the grasses grew en masse, 
huge amounts of seed produced because the grass is trying to cut, deal with that uh, situation too. The grass is trying to make the most of the boom when it happens, put out as much seed as it can. So the seed eaters are responding the same way. Now nomadism, moving from place to place, looking for the best resources is another tactic because across Australia, you do get very different conditions can happen. It's pretty much a small continent. And so if we have an extremely dry couple of years here, there's nothing to say that the gold fields in WA or perhaps the Gulf country over in Queensland, they might have some wet years. And so the budgies, by being able to move on that sort of scale, cross-continental, they go where these resources are. And that's another tactic they've got to get them through the dry years. So a huge function of seed eating birds is that they, as they fly from spot to spot, the places that they're spending more time, they're more likely to uh, drop dung. So that process, when you scale it up like it's going on here, where there's tens of thousands of birds, they're going out into the broad landscape, they're eating the seeds, that are packed full of calories, but also full of nutrition, minerals, vitamins, all that sort of stuff, all the good stuff. And then those birds are having to come to places where they congregate. They're coming to water sources to drink, and then they're also going to sites to nest and to sleep. So any tree that is providing a service to the budgies, like a tree hollow or a really nice safe place to sleep, is gonna be paid back with fertilizer. Now it sounds trivial, you know, one budgie maybe drops, what, a gram of dung overnight. You multiply that up, 50,000 budgies, that's 50,000 grams of dung every night being deposited underneath these trees. On a landscape scale, that is an incredible service that they're doing and it's really helping the biodiversity because it's taking those resources that are spread out and concentrating them where uh, a lot of high value plants, trees, fruiting plants, can really make the most of it. So the budgies are performing a massive service for the whole landscape. It's always surprised me that Australians, when they reach for things that are quintessentially Australian, you know, they talk about sheep farms or, um, you know, AFL, something like that, or, uh, or even pavlovas. Uh, but for me, probably the ultimate Australian experience you can have is to be standing on a cold morning uh, on a place like this, on a hill, absolutely surrounded by 
thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of these tiny little seed eating birds. They are as Australian as you're ever going to get and this is the real Australia. 70% of the Australian mainland is arid zone, it's habitat for budgies and um, once every 10 years or so there'll be a giant event like this anywhere in the outback and um, that chance to see it is something that a lot of people don't take up and uh, I, that baffles me actually, like who, who wouldn't want to experience this? It's, uh, it's one of the great natural wonders of the world.